I'm dead. I'm dead. The words repeated on a loop in Sully Cantana's head as he raced through the winding tunnels of the abandoned factory. Focused columns of heat blasted from the vents, staggered along the wall, pumping acrid smoke into the tight passageway. A series of desperate shots boomed behind him. It sounded like the hand cannon Jens was known to carry. Sully guessed he was digging in. Better him than me, Sully thought. Rip of gunfire was silently silenced by a chorus of high-speed energy weapons, bringing back those words again. I'm dead. I'm dead. Sully cut around a corner. His feet skidded on a puddle of something and nearly came out from under him. He managed to catch one of the pipes on the wall, righted himself and raced forward. He'd scattered the factory before the drop, a habit he'd picked up in the past year or two. But now he, he was just trying to keep the terror at bay so he could remember the winding layout that led to... The access door came into view ahead of him. He pushed even harder and shoved his full weight into the metal. It flung open. Sully quickly slammed it behind him and jammed a piece of metal shrapnel into the door lock, hoping it slowed down his pursuers. Thin metal stairs wound up around the walls. He wasted no time, leaping two, three steps at once, even though his legs burned. By the time he hit the top, somebody crashed into the door he came through. His improvised lock held. Sully quickly pulled on his gloves and hood as Heavy impacts rammed against the door below. By the time he'd gotten his goggles on, the door downstairs buckled. Heavy footsteps thudded up the stairs. Sully wrenched the handle and pushed the heavy rusted door at the top of the stairs open. A swirl of dirt and dust blew into the factory. He could already feel the dull burn of the dirt through the fabric. He, he slipped out the door and hustled away. Tour had been on the outskirts of Lorville. Factories out here were either automated or had outlived their usefulness. They were also within walking distance of residential areas, so it made it for a convenient place to meet. Sully cut into the winding alleyways to keep out of sight. He weaved his way around piles of trash, leaving oddly colored fluids as he made his way through the most populated areas. Over the wind, he could start to hear the oddly placid music intended to keep the populace calm, meaning he was close. Although he strained to hear the armored footsteps of his pursuer through the howling wind, he knew he wouldn't hear any voices. It was one of the most unsettling things about executive security. They only turned on their external speakers if they were addressing you directly. The rest of the time, they were completely silent. Their sealed, heavy armor obscured all conversations they were undoubtedly having. Up ahead, a trickle of people passed the mouth of the alley. Sully slowed as he approached and glanced around the street. He was in one of the commercial sectors, placed near a travel hub, so workers could quickly pick up any last-minute items on their way to the factories. Sully hadn't, really, hadn't truly factored in how pathetic these stores were until he'd gotten off world. The shelves and all of them were mostly bare, only displaying a handful of sanctioned items that Hurston imported. The storefronts themselves, although they had colorful names, all bore the same owned and operated by Hurston Dynamics Inc. disclaimer on their signs. Although everybody was dressed in similar clothes, wrapped up in multiple layers to protect against the corrosive dirt, and did not look up. Every gaze looked on the ground ahead. Kala had always said it was the mindset of the people here. Keep your head down, focus on the path right in front of you. She'd have been the most pragmatic. Then even Sully. At least that was how she'd describe herself. He thought it was a mindset of the broken. This is why Sully had to leave. He kept his head down while passing a camera, cluster perched above. A dozen or so lenses were aimed to spy the, the entire street. Speakers embedded among them pumped out obnoxious music. He passed underneath and slowly trudged. It took all of his restraint not to run his way up to the monorail station. At the top, 
suddenly glanced toward the alley he just left. There was no sign of his pursuers. The only security were in an enclosed observation post perched above the checkpoint. Sully queued up and waited. When his turn finally came, he stepped into the small antechamber. The laminate door swung close, and he scanned his card. A moment later, the screen flashed green, and the plexidor glass in front of him opened. A monorail was just pulling into the station. Sully filed into the train with the other workers. Focused, dynamic tubes fired burst of air at each person stepped into the door of the monorail, blasting dust and dirt from their clothes. It was part of the public health initiative that Hurston Dynamics had unveiled ten years ago. But like everything else in Hurston, nobody ever took it seriously. Sully slid into the seat. As the adrenaline wore off, his legs started to burn. But Sully couldn't think about that now. He had to figure out what went so wrong. This was hardly the first time Sully had made a run to Lorville. Ever since he linked up with Peng's gang five years ago, he'd done a handful of smuggling jobs here. As much as he despised coming back to this hellhole, the black market mostly sold stuff easily gotten off world. You could buy a pair of DMC pants anywhere and sell it for four, sometimes five times the price here. The only tricky part is you had to get it past security. And that's what his job was. A breeze op, running a bunch of clothes and food that nobody would look twice at anywhere else in the UEE. Once landed, he contacted Shaw, his guy on the inside, who routed the specialty cargo Pass the customs check and put it them on a freight to the freight factories. Once the customs check on the rest of Sully's cargo had been cleared, he met with Jens and made the deal. Everything had just gone as it always had. Perfect. Healthy amounts of paranoia, but otherwise respect. Jens had two of his usual enforcers there to help carry the crates. He cracked open the third crate. But instead of hydroponic growth supplements, it was jars and jars of Widow. Jens turned to Sully. What the hell is this? Sully was dumbfounded. He barely heard the question. I, I, I don't. He managed to stammer. A dozen energy weapons hummed to life above them. Jens, his enforcers, and Sully turned to see Hurston security lining the catwalks above rifles already aimed afternoon gentlemen an augmented voice cut through the silence Sully turned to see a form step from the hallway the armor had officer markings on it I'll be honest the thing that usually bothers me the most is that people are spending their days being productive, contributing to the betterment of the world by putting in their 12 hours and going home. You types try to make more money for less work. The security officer calmly circled Jens and Sully. Jens enforcers kept glancing at the security up top while Jens look, looked and locked eyes with the officer as he stepped over the crate of Widow. But, but this, he said as he lifted the jar of the thick black liquid, po poisoning our populace with this junk, well, I, I just can't stand for. We, Sully started to speak when the officer backhanded him. The armor augmented the hit, sending Sully sliding across the dirty floor. Jen's hand slowly drifted behind his back. The officer unlatched his helmet and pulled it off. He was an older, probably late sixties, tan, weathered skin, cold, gray eyes. He walked towards Sully and leaned down. I didn't say you could speak. What's this gonna cost? Jen's muttered. The security officer paused. Eyes still locked on Sully, then smiled. What? I I'll pay you boots every month, but it, it ain't never enough. See, it seems there's always someone else who wants a little slice of the action. Jens glanced around. 
seemingly bored with the whole interaction. So what's it going to be this time? I want the name of everyone you pay out to, the officer said as he turned to Jens. Sully glanced around. There, there is maybe a side door, maybe, maybe four or five meters away. Yeah, sure. I, I got a list right here. Jens yanked out a holdout pistol from his waistband and opened fire. His enforcers dove for their rifles. The officer brought up his armored hand just in time to stop Jen's shots. Let's do this the hard way then, the officer said with a grin and calmly drew his sidearm. Jens drew his heavy ballistic. That's when Sully ran. The monorail lurched to a stop. The, the droll voice announced that services and alternate rail lines that were available at the station. Sully had one more to go b before the pads where his ship was parked. He, he went over every step of the job. The cargo was prepped on New Babbage like usual. Peng had made the delivery, but uh, he wasn't the type of guy to mess with drugs. Peng was an optimist who liked getting paid. He liked to play things safe rather than chase and uh, feel the rush of pushing boundaries. Running that kind of weight in Allureville was a death wish kind of deal. Sully leaned against the window of the monorail, passed into shadow. He looked at the monolithic Hearst Dynamics building, blocking out the sun. Unfortunately for him, to get the hell out of here, he'd have to go through the heart of corporate security. The train began to slow as it approached the next stop. Sully got up and joined the other passengers clustered by the door. Striding through the monorail station, he brought up his Moby and pushed the comm to Ping. Hey, what's up? Peng murmured. As he appeared on the comm a moment later, clearly woken from a nap. Well, one sec, Sully said and headed for a crowd of people to hide his conversation from the cameras. What the hell did you have me transport? What do you mean, man? One of the crates, uh, Sully dropped his voice to hide it from people around him. Uh, one of them was loaded with damn widow. Quit playing, man. Do I look like I'm playing? The crowd around Sully started to move, so he kept pace. Not only that, the security were all over the drop. Jens is dead, probably. That woke Bang up. Whoa, hold up. I, I don't know anything about no goddamn widow, man. Then how did it get in the crate? Hell if I know. Peng started getting really nervous. Y you ever lose sight of the cargo? No, no, man. It, it was... Sully paused. There was a gap where it was out of sight. Shaw. His contact on the pads who slipped it past customs. Hey, look. You, uh... You need to get the hell out of there. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Peng. What do, you, what do you think I'm doing? Yeah, right away. Anyway, don't, don't contact me. Don't be clear. Peng dropped the comm. Sully muttered to himself and broke from the crowd to head towards the pad. He knew Peng was probably cleaning house, deleting any records of Sully from his comm, data pads, whatever, playing it safe again. Sully stepped inside the Archimedes flight and glanced around. Pilots were clustered around the various terminals trying to order their ships and get the hell out of there. Cameras covered every square inch of the place. He scanned the faces of the employees and found Shaw staring vacantly into space as some customer in an ill-fitted flight suit yammered at him. Sully quickly made his way over and stepped behind the customer. It's important that my ship is kept covered, the customer droned on. I've made extensively about the atmospheric conditions, and as my reading shows, I will not have my hull tarnished by whatever is floating in that air outside. It took a few moments before Shaw noticed him standing there. When he did, he turned to the customer. 
Go away. The customer stopped speaking, utterly shocked. Shaw's expression hadn't changed. He just stared at the customer until he moved away, then turned to Sully. Hi, welcome to Archimedes' flight. Shaw said in an unconvincingly chipper tone. How can I help you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I seem to have some difficulty with my cargo. Sorry to hear that. We do our best to make sure that our clients are satisfied, but sometimes accidents do happen. Sully leaned in close. We need to talk. I'm sorry, I can't do that at the moment, Shaw replied with a placid smile. He then typed something into his data pad. I've updated your hangar file with the relevant info. Thanks. Sully turned and walked away. Once outside, his Moby pinged. There was a message from an unregistered user that simply said, Bay for 10 minutes. A pair of ships marked with Hurston Security livery blasted overhead toward the factory district where Sully had just come from. This was not good. Shaw was already late. The bay was dark, empty. Sully passed the time, scanning the Hurston spectrum for any kind of alert or notification. It was too quiet. The announcer was cheerfully explaining how workers' productivity was up over this past quarter, leading to a 2% profit growth. Finally, the door to the hall slid open, spilling light inside. Sully ducked behind a terminal. It was Shaw strolling in like nothing was wrong. About time, Sully muttered as he stepped out. Hey, I'm on the clock. You, you get what, my time when I want to give it. Shaw popped a stem, <laughs> held his arms out expectantly. <laughs> so? Turns out my package had a little extra cargo in there. About ten jars of Widow Extra. Shaw was silent. You, you know anything about that? Why the hell would I? <laughs> Only time that cargo was out of my sight was when you were moving it. Well, I'm not in the habit of swapping boxes. Shaw took a drag off the stem. Bring the stuff back and I can see if anyone's lights on some widow. I can't. <laughs> Why not? Because Hurston's was all over the drop. They've got it now. Shaw leaned back against the wall inside. <laughs> Guess you're screwed then. It wasn't my stuff. It is now. Shaw took a last puff of the stem and ejected the spent cartridge. Sorry, Sully. I, th I think it might be time for you to disappear again. <laughs> can, can you bring my ship? Yeah, sure. Shaw walked over to one of the other terminals and booted it up. After several load screens, he accessed the hangar module and punched in some commands. His expression darkened because the hangar module isn't available right now. Sully noticed. That was a joke. Oh, come on! What now? There's a landing lock on your ship. Shaw started punching in some other commands. He was no longer laughing. Suddenly, he stopped, then ripped the power cable out of the wall. The terminal went dead. Secure, security, security flagged me. Ask about your location. You gotta go now. Sully started heading for the door. Shaw jogged after him. Once outside, they looked up and down the empty hall. One, one more thing, man. Shaw turned to Sully. Once he was satisfied that the hall was empty, you drop me to Hurston, you're dead in an hour. We clear? Sully stared at him, shocked. Good. Glad we have an understanding. Shaw took off and left Sully alone in the hall. <laughs> Sully backed up and headed onto the main atrium of Archimedes' flight. A handful of security officers suddenly appeared at the entrance. They pushed past Sully and unslung rifles as they moved toward the hangars. He quickly pulled on his protective gear and set out onto the street. With his ship impounded, uh, his options were dwindling. He could try 
and find another ride off world. But he'd have to go through customs to get out. With security locking down Archimedes' flight, it was unlikely he'd even make it to customs. That left flew fleeing the city. If, if he could get to some other town, maybe, well, maybe there'd be another way to get off this damn planet. Roving beams of sunlight cut through the dark clouds to shine on the passing city below. The Hurston Dynamics building receded into the distance, its top disappearing into the rolling clouds. The train quietly sailed along the elevated rails, heading into one of the residential zones. Leavesden Square has always been one of Lorville's most depressing housing blocks. The sterile gray walls and stairwells look more like a fortress than a home. Sully watched the dark buildings approach, pinpoints of visible light from narrow windows. You know, growing up in this hellhole, he knew exactly how violent the towers could be. Clearly, not much had changed in the past five years. In fact, Leavesden actually looks worse. For that reason, leaving Lorville had never even been a question. When he finally found his way out, taking his way into a training position on a scrap hauler, he didn't hesitate. He left family, friends, Kala. But he had to. He couldn't live on this godforsaken planet one more day. Now, he was back going there. It wasn't a prospect he was not necessarily looking forward to. Sure, he thought about coming back. See if Kala could finally cut herself loose of this place. But he knew she wouldn't. She had too many ties. She never have the, that urge to see what the universe had to offer. Sully glanced at the other passengers in the train. Clustered dirt covered workers fresh off 12 hour shifts and munition plants or sledging rock or whatever. He knew he was looking at the broken. He didn't even pity them anymore. They pissed him off. He wanted to smack them, tell them to wake up and realize that they're, that, that they're almost slaves. But he knew how they'd respond. They'd mumble something about life being hard everywhere or some similar nonsense. The train pulled into Leaveston Station. His dread about coming back here was almost as bad as the gnawing fear of Hurst and security. Oh, most. The door opened and Sully fled out. He walked through the common area, through four monolithic buildings. Concentric concrete circles descended into the ground, into a rusted playground. A group of kids sat there, glaring at Sully as he approached, their arms and faces bare like some kind of brazen but stupid act of defiance. Their skin was already showing discoloration from the toxins in the air. Sully knew if they stood up, it meant a fight, so he kept his pace even. The kids watched him as he passed. One of them leaned back and grinned, displaying a patch of cheaply sewn into his shirt material. Civilian constable service. Hurston's eyes, ears, and if the situation called for it, enforcers recruited from the Civ Pop. They were security cannon fodder, rats who'd sell out fellow workers for a pat on the head. Sully kept his head down and kept walking. The kids glanced at each other clearly deciding what to do, but then went back to their hushed conversation. Sully continued to the atrium of Tower B, gave a quick check on the kids to be safe, then brought up the directory on the wall at the terminal. He scrolled down until he found Kagan in the registry and punched the code. Yeah? An older but familiar voice murmured into the tiny speaker. Joe, it's Sully. Then nothing for a full minute. Sully just stood there, waiting. He knew this was a bad idea. Why, why did he come here? The door buzzed. Joe Kagan looked old. It had only been five years since Sully had last seen him, but he looked like he'd been, it had been ten, even. 
still had that focused look in his eyes. He looked warier, sure, but there was still that intensity. They met in the halls of Tower B when they were eight years old. Joe's family had just moved in after his dad got transferred to a new dig site, and a group of the older kids were welcoming him to the floor. Joe was about 30 clicks into the beatdown when Sully came charging in with a punch that knocked Macaw Rogers out cold. That was Sully's one good shot. He quickly returned and joined Joe on the bottom of the kicking pile. Needless to say, they had stuck together ever since. As they got older, they shared a defiant streak. Whenever trouble got into, it was always worth it if it resulted in those sacred words, make Hurston pay. It took over 10 years of being inseparable to finally figure out what divided them. Joe decided that pranks and sabotage were pointless if they didn't coincide with real efforts to make change. Sully just liked pissing people off. The night before Sully took off from Moorville, they'd argued again. Sully called Joe delusional. Joe called him a coward. Now, Sully was sitting across from his old friend in the same two-room apartment his friend's, his friend's parents once occupied. The walls were covered in historical revolutionaries. Some bizarro music played from his speakers. Joe was in an old chair, just staring at Sully. How are your parents? I died. Oh. Sully settled back. Damn, sorry. Silence again. Except for that dreadful music. So, you still fighting the good fight? <laughs> Sully said with a chuckle. <laughs> We're petitioning to try to get Hurston to authorize a workers' council to oversee safety conditions. Sully couldn't help but stifle a laugh. Joe shook his head. What do you want, Sully? I, uh, I need a hand getting out of the city. You got legs. Walk. I need to get out. Quiet, quietly. Joe stood up, walked to that kitchen. Some water was boiling. He made tea and coughed slightly. Let me see if I get this. You vanish for five years, then pop up, clearly in trouble, and you expect me to help. Kinda? <laughs> yeah. What did you do? Do does it matter? Joe stammered at the mug. A handle broke off. He looked at it for a second and tossed it in the sink. What did you do, Joe reiterated, regaining his sullen composure. <laughs> Sully tried to get his self straight, got his best composure, and responded. Look, I was running some cargo into the city. There was a mix-up with the packages, and I got nabbed, and, and there's some nasty stuff to it. But it wasn't fun. I, I swear. So you're just a straight-up criminal now. I was bringing in clothes, some hydroponic supplies, simple stuff to make people's lives better. <sighs> but you aren't. Joe rubbed his temples. You still don't get it, do you? Smuggling in contraband isn't making anyone's lives better. It's putting them on the razor's edge, giving Hurston the evidence to crack down even harder when they get caught. Sure, because your petition is really going to make changes around here. Sully snapped back. I'll bet the execs are laughing their asses off. They fell silent again. Look, I, I need your help. Sully said, his voice calmed down again. Help me. I I'll never, I'll never see you again. Joe thought for a few moments. <laughs> I, I can't, he finally said. I, I know you couldn't care less, but we're trying to make changes around here. I can't get my people mixed up in smuggling. I'm sorry. Sully stood up. 
and walked to the window. Though he wasn't surprised by Joe's response, the walls of his situation felt like they were closing in. He couldn't hide out in the city for long. Not now. He looked out the windows, down in the common area between the towers. Hurston's security was talking to the CSS kids. They pointed to Tower B. All of the security turned toward the tower. Shit. Sully muttered. What? Joe asked as he came rushing to the window. He followed Sully's gaze. Shit. <laughs> Joe rushed to one of the closets and pulled on some new goggles, coat, and gloves. Here, he tossed to Sully. S so you'll help me? I, I can't get you out of the city, but I can buy you some time to get away. You remember that old stairwell where Two-Tone used to deal out of? Yeah, Silly replied, quickly pulling on the new clothes. Whole thing's been condemned, so they, they cut off the power to those cameras. That'll take you all the way down. Slip out the back and make a run for it. All right, thanks. Silly paused on the door. He held his hand out. It was, it was good to see you. Joe hesitated and then shook it. Let me know if you ever start to care, he said. Silly took off down the hall. The building's intercom cracked to life as he ran. Attention, Leavesden Square Tower residents. This is Sergeant McManus, Hurston Security. We have reason to believe a dangerous criminal has entered your building. We will be enacting security protocols to secure all residents until a proper search can be conducted. All the apartment doors suddenly latch shut as the automatic door locks engaged. Any tenant caught outside will need to provide authorized identification. Sully hit the doorway at the back of the stairwell as it swung open. He was slammed in the face with the wall of rank odor. Years of mold, dirt, grime were compounded with the remnants of whoever had been using that stairwell for a toilet. He pulled his protective hood closer to his face and descended into the pitch black stairwell. Floor after floor after floor passed. The decrepit state of the stairs meant he had to take each step carefully and more than once he almost slipped off and onto something else he wouldn't be grateful to see. He could hear the heavy footsteps moving through the halls outside. A few times Hurston security would venture a look into the stairwell but they never lingered. One glance at the state of it was enough to convince them that no one in their right mind would be in there willingly. Sully finally reached the bottom floor and moved to the exit that let them out the back of the tower. He pushed the door open and slipped out. There wasn't any security in sight, so he started to hustle off towards another one of the tower blocks. That's when he almost ran into one of the CCS kids this was one of the older one who proudly displayed his badge, but thanks to Joe's new clothes, he didn't recognize Sully. Hey, building's locked down. Oh, I, I, I know. Thanks. I already talked to security. They cleared me to go. Kid looked at Sully. He started to raise his Moby glass to make a call. Sully hit him and ran. He didn't glance back, and he'd made sure to make it to the next resident tower. Security were absolutely swarming the building he'd just left. They'd even call in some hovers to watch it from the air. He knew he was running out of time. Sully rang the bell for Kala's apartment. Off of all the things he'd been through in the past few hours, this was the most terrifying yet. This waiting after he pressed the button knowing that she was on her way to the door. He would have never seen her again, then face her like this. Finally, the door opened. Calla, wearing her uniform, was dumbfounded by the man standing in the doorway. She would still took his breath away, even after all this time. Hey, Kay, he said. She punched him in the face with a solid cross that busted Joe's goggles and snapped his head back. His legs wobbled while his head swam. 
What the hell? Sully shouted as he threw his hands up and tried to steady himself. You son of a bitch. What the hell do you want, she muttered. It's a long story, Sully replied, keeping his hands up defensively. Can, can I come inside? Kala thought it over for a second, then turned and walked inside, leaving the door open. Sully walked in and closed the door. The apartment was almost exactly as he remembered it. The one difference was that the pictures had been replaced. Now they were quiet, intimate moments of Kala with some other guy. A quiet shot. In the afternoon of her reading, the two of them in a bar. Then a real kicker, Kala, the guy, and a little boy. Kala turned back to him, studying the picture. And she said that his name's Max, and he finally got to sleep, so keep it quiet. You guys look happy, she said, we try. Sully pointed to the guy in the picture. I is he here too? She replied that he's working. Sully nodded and looked back at the picture. How long? She replied, what difference does it make? I'd just like to know. Kala stated, I don't know, maybe a year after you'd vanished, Kala responded. Actually, there's something I'd like to know. What the hell happened to you? I had to leave! Kala replied, had to. Needed to. Sully stepped inside and pulled off his goggles. He couldn't help fidgeting with them. And anything to have to not have to look at her. I, I couldn't do it anymore, Kay. I, I couldn't take this place. I couldn't take the fact that it was draining us all. Kala replied, so you left? I knew you wouldn't go. Kala replied, maybe you should have asked. Kala rubbed the knuckles of her punching hand. It might have surprised you. Sully moved across the room to her. How about now? I need to get the hell out of here, like immediately. You could come with me. He grabbed her hand, seized by the excitement of the idea. Y you still work in freight, right? We could use your clearance, hop a train, and be out of the city in a couple hours, on a ship a few hours after that. Kala replied, what? And stepped away. You can't imagine what it's like out there, he said, following her. There's so much. It's to life. It's overwhelming. People are happy. The future is full of possibilities. It's not smog and work until you die. Kala, please, let me get you out of here. Kala looked for a moment. She touched the wrinkles on her face, on his face, and appeared since she'd last seen him. She replied that you had your chance, Sully. The wall screen suddenly flared to life with a piercing alert noise. Sully could hear the same alert emanating through the walls of the other apartments. The screen showed Hurston Dynamics logo with a security bullet. Sully suddenly knew what was about to happen. Attention, citizens of Hurston. Security forces are on the lookout for Sullivan Kanata for illegal drug trafficking and assault. Sully's picture from one of these arrests in his youth appeared on the screen alongside a frame grabbed from a camera in Archimedes' flight. The voice on the wall screen continued. A reward of 30,000 credits will be given to or any information that leads to the capture of this individual. Kella turned and looked at him. The hurt in her eyes was devastating. It wasn't me, he said weakly, but he knew how it sounded. She replied, get out. A young voice replied, Mom? Max stepped out, rubbing his eyes. Kala replied, It's okay, honey. Just an alarm. Don't worry about it. Sully worked into the bathroom and shut the door. This was it. His face was plastered over the entire world. His gaze drifted down the edge of the sink. Kala must have left her ID and clearance badge. They're, they're, they're washed her face after work. He could take it. Maybe he could still make it to a freight train. There was a chance that the alert hadn't gone global yet. And who knows how many people really pay attention to that. Then he thought about what would happen to Kala if he took it. 
she'd probably get locked up and, and for eating a fugitive. With their past, no one would believe that she'd turn him away. She'd lose her job, maybe even lose Max. His freedom would come at the cost of hers. He, he looked down at his Moby glass. Sully stepped away and back into the small living room. Out of the corner of his eye, he caught a glimpse of a familiar picture taken six years ago. It was Sully, Kala, and Joe. Tremendously drunk one night at Felix's bar after they sloppily assembled for a picture. He hadn't thought about that night in years. Kala replied, I'm serious, Sully. You need to get out of here. As she exited Max's room and shut the door. I, I know. The sound of sirens approaching rose above the howling wind. Calla rushed to the window and looked out. Hurston security transports and hovers swarmed down the street and swept around the building. Calla stated, you gotta go, Sully. Do me a favor, Sully replied. He was calm and resigned. Y you guys should do something fun, okay? Calla stated, what are you talking about? Sully stepped close and took her hands. I I'm really sorry, you know. As, as much as I wanted to leave this place, leaving you was the one thing I never got over. Calla studied for a second, realizing how eerily resigned he was. Calla stated, what did you do? Sully smiled and backed away towards the door. Calla stated, Sully? Back, eh? He pulled the door open and screamed at the top of his lungs, You sold me out! Sully ran out, shouting the whole way as he thundered down the stairs. Hurston security stunned him in the lobby. He screamed about how Kala ratted him out until he drifted in out of a consciousness. Sully came to in the back of a transport. He could feel his hands bound behind his back. He couldn't see thanks to the bag on his head, but figured he was probably heading to central booking. He was surprised at how okay he felt. Even with everything that was outside of his control, the stuff he brought on himself, he didn't mind taking his hit. Besides, he'd done scattered time in Hurston jails before. It'd take him a couple of months probably to get his bearings, but... He'd have the place wired within a year. Then all he'd have to do is either bide his time or wait for an opportunity to escape. Best of all, thanks to the tip he dropped on Hurston's security and Max's name, Callan and her family would be getting a nice fat reward. Like he and Joe used to say, Make Hurston pay. The transport lurched to a stop. Sully could hear the door get out pulled open. Footsteps approached him. Two pairs of hands wrenched him up from the seat and half dragged him out of the transporter. Suddenly the bag was ripped off his head. McManus, the Hurston security sergeant who killed Jens, was standing in front of him. Sully looked around. They stood in the middle of nowhere. No prison, no central booking, no Lorville, even. What? Sully stammered, trying to figure this out. He looked back. The only other Hurston security officer stood by the transport, engaging in mute conversation. Uh, where's the prison? That's the thing, McManus replied as he drew his sidearm. Money's real tight these days. He raised the pistol and fired. Two weeks later, Kala was balancing their finances while a man cooked dinner. Max was playing with some of his toys. Her terminal pinged from an incoming message. She clicked on it. The message was from Hurston Dynamic and addressed to Max. It was 30,000 credit reward for aiding Hurston security in the apprehension of a dangerous criminal. What a bittersweet story. If you made it this far, thank you for sticking with me. It was a little bit challenging trying to make up, I don't know, voices for a whole bunch of people and then trying to narrate the part for Kala because I wasn't even going to try that. <laughs>
But uh, that was The Payout by Dave Haddock. Now, this originally showed in point, Jump Point 5.1. I usually enjoy going through and digging up which one that's from. I can tell you that it ain't from this year. That's all I can keep off the top of my head. Or at the very least, not from 2021, to be fair. <laughs> and uh, I've long stated, please, please, lore team, start releasing these faster and give yourself credit. I always mention this. You know, in these messages at the top and the bottom, you could put a message saying that if you wish to subscribe to see more of this content faster, you can get you can see these in the jump points. So there should be like a little plug here for the subscription process. Because that's what this is from. Subscriber funds pay for the jump point. And these are articles from Jump Point. It's a monthly it's a monthly subscriber only newsletter. And then eventually the way it's supposed to go is lore posts from jump points then are disseminated through the com links on the robertspaceindustries.com website. And that's where I picked this up at. Um, I really enjoy these stories, but I can't talk about them until they're put out in public. So uh, lore team, keep fighting the good fight. Thank you for making content. And uh, to everyone listening, please like, comment, subscribe if you got a kick out of this, even if you just found it funny. I, I had some fun with this myself, uh, especially in the middle there. I, a little e e there's a little Easter egg for the hangar terminal. If anybody is the folks that have been around for the hangar app in the early days uh, before that, I shouldn't have made it so overt. <laughs> I kind of beat you over the head with that at the egg. I apologize for that. And um, this was taken in, well, I guess technically two takes. Uh, so I tried to keep this visceral and exciting and really try to capture the desperation of Sully and and, and the confusion and the anger and, and the concern uh, of his of his old friends and romantic interest and his best, you know, his best friend and probably the closest he has to family left, you know, uh, really cool stuff. And well, yeah, I, I love these type of things, especially fleshing out Lorville. Lorville is an exciting place. It's got a lot of action. It's like the Blade Runner that, that didn't, doesn't even have the nice parts uh, in a lot of ways. Yes, I know. The real Blade Runner is Area 18. I know. I know. But um, I feel like Lorville is like all the technology with none of the benefits for the folks who live there. And Lorville is based on a company town. So the idea is that the word Ville was added to the end of the L-O-R name, which was like something, something residence, uh, like a like very corporate sounding thing. Um, and they added Vil to the end. Uh, this is this is per Lore Team a couple weeks ago. They added the word Vil to the end of Loreville to to really emphasize that it's a company town. Um, through and through, Hurston owns it. And unlike other places that have respect for their folks that work there and respect for their residents in in, in ways, this fictional town uh, in this in this world that, that is being created. They truly treat their their employees like they like they, they they remind them every step of the way who's truly in charge in their eyes, and I actually love the fact that this story had that story of Joe, somebody who's going to obviously be far more motivated to try to make changes in Lauraville for the better of the residents, for the better of the all the working the workers in that city, and I, I think that's a really cool little fact, little 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 thing there. Um, and I hope it's stories that have little bits like that. Like I'd love to hear more about Joe's character and his future in this world and Kala. I'd love to hear what happens to Kala and Max. And uh, that's sometimes some of the best stories. So once again, this was The Payout by Dave Haddock. It was originally a jump point, a subscriber only thing. It is now public. You can see it on robberspaceindustries.com uh, com link section. I'll have a link directly below to the article. I hope you enjoyed this. Have a great day.